welcome everybody who's attending. And uh, again, uh, for those who are just joining, this is going to be a little bit uh, interactive. So certainly uh, feel free to answer some of the questions that I throw out to you guys. Just type it in the chat box. Uh, you've all been muted just so we're not talking over one another, but type it up into the chat box and I'll see it and Joanna will see it. Um, and also just general questions. Don't wait for me to ask you something. If you have a question about one of the cases or stories I'm uh, talking about, go ahead and ask the question. And then at the end, we'll open it up for a Q&A. Um, so this is, uh, this is called Adventures of a Worldwide Vet. I am Cliff Redford, uh, as she said, a veterinarian here in Toronto, just a little bit north of you guys. Um, I've got a YouTube channel, check it out. And for those of you on Instagram, I probably use that a whole lot more. And then at the bottom of the screen is my email address and it'll come up at the end as well. Uh, email me anything. If you got questions about your dog or your cat or your bird or your snake, um, I'm happy to help. Uh, and I should say we are supporting the El Evelyn Alexander Wildlife Rescue Center. So for those of you that uh, paid a small fee to listen to me talk for an hour. That money is going to the rescue center, which is uh, in your neck of the woods. So check them out and support your local, uh, your local wildlife and animal rescue, please. All right, let's give this a shot here. So I'm gonna have a whole bunch of uh, photos and videos. Um, and some of them are, some of the videos are up to about 90 seconds long. Um, just showing some of the adventures I've had over the last six years traveling around the world and some of the adventures I've had locally working with wildlife as well. Uh, and I guess, so for a bio, I'm Dr. Cliff Redford. I've been a veterinarian since 1998, um, but uh, that chubby cheeked little guy on the corner there uh, is me when I was probably about six years old. And uh, I've wanted to be a veterinarian even since I was six years old. So I'm, I'm living my dream, which is great. But I have a life outside of being a veterinarian. Um, I'm a bit of a martial artist and used to compete in judo. Uh, I do like to, uh, during Halloween, dress up like 80s uh, rock and roll stars because I think 80s rock and roll music is the greatest. A um, bit of a marathon runner and ultra marathoner. But recently I fell in love with the sport of surfing. And there's a few surfers in Long Island and just, you know, just south of us, right? We all share Lake Ontario. Um, and the water is cold and the waves are spectacular. And uh, that's something that I'm really, uh, really quite addicted to these days. But um, so with these travels, and the reason I have so many photos and videos is I actually had a bit of a dream of, uh, of making a TV show out of this called Dr. Cliff Worldwide Vet. So some of these videos are gonna be pretty polished as far as editing with music and the whole bit, because we even, knocked on broadcasters' doors and, and tried to sell them this TV show idea. And I haven't given up on my dream yet, but I've found that uh, the journey has really been kind of uh, more enjoyable than the destination potentially. And it's something that I continue planning on doing as far as traveling and, and volunteering well beyond even if TV stops ever existing, you know. So the first place I went to, and I'm gonna have you guys, if you can figure it out, type it out, uh, give any guesses, type on the messenger there. The first one I went to was five years ago. Uh, we did both cats, dogs, some wildlife, like uh, one of these uh, greater funnel-eared bats. This, uh, this beach um, is uh, very close to where they filmed Dr. No back in, I think the 60s, the very first James Bond movie. Um, and we worked with a local SPCA, met a few snake friends. In the SPCA, you know, we have problems here with people locking their cars in hot, or locking their dogs in hot cars. Well, they have problems with people locking their pets in car trunks, uh, which we actually saw a few times. Uh, this is Arakabesa Bay on the North shore of this West Indies Island, uh, where we did some coral planting to help with some of the, the fish uh, repopulation efforts. And then, uh, stop it. Here's a video taken the first night we were in this, uh, this country watching Usain Bolt win his very last, pardon me, his second last gold medal. This was five years ago. Um, and uh, this was in his hometown. So uh, that's a pretty big hint. But just listen to the crowd and then you guys all should be able to figure out where we're, where we're filming this from. Any 
ideas, any uh, guesses on where that was? Um, so again, that was actually in Usain Bolt, who's uh, definitely the fastest uh, runner in the world uh, and the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Uh, yes, Jamaica, Cake Baker, 58, got it right. Um, so that was actually not only in his home city in Kingston, but that was in his sports bar called Tracks and Records the night he won uh, that gold medal. Uh, and I'm sorry, it was his very last, uh, it was his very last race. And um, it was it was a sight to be a uh, sight to be heard. So we did go to Kingston. We went there for three weeks and we we worked mostly with the Jamaican SPCA, which was basically a surgery and, and exam room built out of this sort of trailer. But then they had a good hundred or so cages uh, outside underneath these corrugated metal uh, roofing systems for all the homeless dogs and injured animals. And it was a pretty amazing time. Um, now the first day, or I should say when we got there, I brought some supplies with me. I brought various drugs and sutures and needles and vaccines. But what I didn't bring and what I didn't realize was so needed were Elizabethan collars or cones of shame, those big cones. But Jamaicans are quite a resourceful bunch. Uh, they actually take uh, very colorful buckets and cut holes in them and turn them into these Z collars. And I think this dog uh, not only looks better with this beautiful blue bucket on his head, but he seems a little happier than, than most dogs wearing the cones of shame. So the very first day before we saw Usain Bolt win his, uh, his race, we, uh, we treated this dog, Wendy. There's quite a few cases, but the, the nice thing about this is it shows some of my uh, comrades in arms here. So the, the, the young lady at the top is Ariane. She was a, uh, a veterinarian student at the time. Um, she is now not only a veterinarian, but she is a, a specialist in critical medicine. So she could actually, here I am teaching her some things, but she could actually teach me a lot now as far as critical medicine is concerned. And then the woman at the bottom of the photo there, her name is Julia. She just had her first baby girl two days ago uh, named Noah. And Julia uh, was a technician student and became my head technician uh, and is now on mat leave, obviously. Um, but it was a great time to be able to bring these students uh, with me, um, not only for the filming, but sort of for the camaraderie. And they learned a lot, I learned a lot, and they were able to, to help save a lot of animals when I was off, you know, climbing in caves or, uh, or, or playing with baby turtles, uh, which we did do on this trip. Um, one of the other things I did was I did do a spay neuter clinic for a few days, and I got to work with this gentleman named Mr. Henry. Henry is his first name, but they, seem to say Mr. and Mrs. and then throw their first names in there. Mr. Henry was what I say, air quotes, just a tech, um, because he's, there's nothing about being a tech that's sort of just, you know, or just a tech. He, uh, he had been a technician there for a good 25 years. Um, he was in his late 50s and I was a pretty good surgeon. I'm a pretty good veterinarian, but he taught me so much in those two days that I worked with him. I had some of the, I had one emergency surgery uh, which is on my YouTube page and also on my Instagram uh, page about this dog that had a uterine infection. And uh, not only was it difficult, it was two hours long and, and, and quite scary and sort of life-threatening for this dog who did do great and fully recovered. But part of it was because Mr. Henry was able to tell me, cut here and tie here and you're using too much suture and we don't have enough gauze, you got to use less gauze. And um, he was right every single time. So I, I, I quickly learned to just be quiet and, and listen to him and, and learn from this, uh, quote, just a technician. Um, so it was one of the great lessons I had from, uh, from that trip is listen to uh, everybody and you'll learn something. Um, so I did, do, uh, I did do some adventure traveling at the same time as rescuing animals. This is in St. Clair Caves. Um, and I mean, it's this amazing cave system that has about 20,000 bats in it. Now we were specifically looking for a, a group, a subspecies called the greater funnel-eared or the Jamaican greater funnel-eared bat. Now, what was so special about this, this bat is there's only 500 of them in the world, all of them in this cave. And the reason they're only in this cave is they are so small that they can't even fly to a neighboring cave five kilometers away or three miles for the Americans, three miles away. 
that they can only stay in that area and then they obviously roost in this uh in this cave that over the last 50,000 years or so they've slowly changed to become their own species so it's this cool little ecosystem they have in there and it was I was a Dungeons and Dragons nerd as a kid and, and still am right now. So going into this cave and walking on feet and feet of pacted bat guano and the stalagmites and the stalactites and the bugs and the dust and all these cool things. Uh, apparently there are cave spirits called cave guppies just to find these bats and to figure out what was killing them because these bats, all these 20,000 bats were at risk of dying. Um, it was quite an amazing, uh, it's quite an amazing experience. Um, so I've got a video coming up and it basically, it shows you some of the, the, you'll see just thousands of bats flying overhead. It's pretty amazing. And just take a look at the, the sort of the scene that's coming up. Look at this guys. Look at the bats. Not that far in the aquarium, there's a little side passage where it runs into a and even like the chimney gap, there's bats that we have moved out from the aquarium. Yeah, the disturbing room we've covered here in the house, which is kind of sick. Some rock. That seems sick. What did you think it was? And as that guy said, he said, it looks so sick. And that's Jan and Steph who uh, run the Jamaican Cave Association. And they're kind of bat experts as well. And actually, uh, if you ever come to Ontario, if you ever come to Toronto, go to the Royal Ontario Museum. And there's actually a, a St. Clair Caves bat exhibit. And it's got these guys' voices talking about these different uh, bats. So we caught five bats. And the one that was hanging upside down on the video previously was quite dehydrated, had lost a lot of weight, and he had this white sort of powder in his nose. Um, and they explained to me he was suffering from a, a, a fatal disease, unfortunately, called white nose syndrome, which is basically, a, it's a fungus. It's an airborne fungus that's sweeping across parts of the US, though down sort of the Southwest, Texas, and that sort of place, um, south of the US and through parts of Europe not in New York, not in Canada yet. And if it was in Canada, they wouldn't actually let me in the cave just in case I had microscopic amounts of these, this fungus on my shoes or my clothes. But that's what was killing some of these bats. But the other thing that was killing the bats, and this is gonna be a recurring story, are the cats. Cats are not native to Jamaica. They were brought over with the colonial um, visitors to kill rats and mice and, and to protect farmland. And unfortunately, they've gone wild and, and feral, and they're killing all kinds of animals on, on Jamaica, in Jamaica. So one of the things that we did is we caught a handful of bats. Uh, this one clearly is a male, as, as you can probably tell. Um, and this, unfortunately, we did not get one of the greater funnel-eared bats. Again, there's only 500 out of 20,000 in this cave. But it's even smaller than this one that we caught, which only weighs about five grams. Uh, which isn't even an ounce. Um, and we measured them and we sort of determined which species they were and uh, took some skin scraping samples that they later did tests on to make sure that they didn't have the disease, which they didn't. Um, so it seemed to be controlled in this cave, which was, was very, very important. But being able to release these bats uh, into the wild was a pretty special, uh, like back into the cave was a pretty special um, experience. So I didn't only deal with cats and dogs and bats in Jamaica. Uh, there was some wildlife cases and here's an American crocodile uh, named Jack. And Jack has an injured left eye that you can see there. So he's soon to become one-eyed Jack. And what I learned uh, again is that Jamaica for such a small and still developing and, and still struggling financially country, they do such a great job in rehabilitating and saving wildlife. The bats, we're going to learn about turtles, we're going to learn about iguanas. And this guy was just a, a, just a, a crocodile living in the area and one of the farmers got scared and shot him unfortunately in the eye with a spear gun. Um, and we ended up having to do surgery to remove the eye. And what I, I had the luck of, of working on this, this crocodile, but also working with the head veterinarian with the GSPCA named Dr. Trawford, and he was a, a, an older gentleman, probably in his late 60s, 
Um, and one of the things he taught me, which took me a while to learn the lesson, was how to avoid getting bitten by these animals when you're sedating them. And the video that's coming up is him basically putting a, a local sedative to freeze the eye. Now, Jack is somewhat sedated in this next scene, but obviously not as much as we thought. And you're gonna see what happens when you try and give a needle to a, to a crocodile that's not fully sedated, even with two big men standing, uh, trying to the cool thing about this video is the entire time dr trofford is standing just calmly by this needle stuck in in jack's eye socket and he's not backing up he's literally just standing there waiting not even getting up off his knees. He's just waiting, waiting, he's trusting his uh, colleagues. And as soon as the crocodile turns over, he just pushes in the medication, freezes the uh, eye orbit and the ocular nerve, and then we're able to safely remove this, uh, this crocodile's eye. And then Jack lived uh, and is still alive and living his life in a very large compound part of the, uh, the Hope Zoo in Kingston. So, uh, and he just, uh, they just throw the food on the other side so he knows where it is. Um, but Dr. Trofford, uh, uh, he's a pretty amazing guy, and you know, I, I look forward to one day when I grow up to be big and strong just like him, uh, and smart and calm. Um, so another gentleman I met, another older gentleman, is Mel the Turtle Man Tenant. And if you check up, there's a great inspirational video through the TED Talk series. If you just look up Mel Turtle Man Tenant, T-E-N-N-A-N-T, and then TED Talks maybe, you'll get a 15 minute talk about how he has basically saved the entire species of the hawksbill turtle, the, the sea turtle. And it all came about by accident. So he had retired from the UK. He was a mathematician and a computer uh, professor. And one day he found these, what he thought were ATV tracks on his beach. Now this is at the Dr. No Beach, that we saw sort of at the beginning when I was trying to, to point out that we we're in Jamaica. He thought they were ATV tracks. He later found out that they were sea turtle tracks. And he found out that they were using the beach right by his villa to lay, to lay their eggs. But what he started to realize in that first year, he started to pay attention and make some counts. And unfortunately, every single egg that was laid died. Like every turtle within the egg died. None of them successfully hatched to even try and make it to the ocean. He did, started doing some research and realized that some of them were being dug up by cats or dogs. Some of the eggs were actually being stolen for soup by some of the locals. Um, and then there was even, like if the nest was close to an ant uh, hill, he would move the nest because the ants were killing the eggs. Or if the nest was laid near a retaining wall, when the rain came, it would flood this nest that was under the, the sand. So he started to move these, these nests around. Now in the first year after that, he released 300 turtles successfully to the ocean. But I got this little video that really shows after 10 years what he's been able to do. And again, without any sort of biology experience, just with analyzing the data and doing some research on his own and just caring and seeing if he can help, he has now become the, the world's greatest expert in rejuvenating sea turtle of any species populations. So these marine biologists and these zoologists are using his techniques um, to, to repopulate or to make these, these species uh, have a much more successful uh, population program. Uh, so here's a cute little video that uh, even the young ones will love. Oh, wait, no, just one more picture. Here's, here's some of the baby turtles that we got to release. Um, you can even see their little belly buttons uh, right about there. It's very adorable. Literally not even a day old. <laughs>
just goes on to show sun sunsets and, and beautiful waves. So as you may have seen there, that first year he released 300. 10 years later, when we went and saw him, which was five years ago, he released 25,000 in one year. And over that 10 year period, he released 150,000 turtles. And after 10 years, those turtles that survive and then breed, the females, come back to the exact same beach. And all tur sea turtles are like that. They have this like GPS system in their brain that even if you, if you move their eggs to another beach, which now they're doing, they hatch on another beach and they'll return to that new beach. They think that's, that's their home beach for laying, laying, uh, laying eggs. So after 10 years, some of these turtles are now starting to come back. So he's starting to see turtles that he had a, a, a part in, in allowing them to, uh, to survive. So hugely inspirational story from a guy who was not a veterinarian, was not a zoologist, marine biologist. He was just a retired guy, mathematician who saw what he thought were ATV tracks and ended up uh, down this uh, long road of, of, of rescuing a species, which is pretty amazing. Um, here is a Jamaican uh, iguana that again, another amazing rescue story from, from the country of Jamaica in the 50s, they were determined extinct, this, this, uh, this reptile. And, but it was only in the mid 90s that they actually found a small family of them up in what's called the Hellshire Hills. They've now sort of, um, they created a sanctuary on the Hellshire Hills. They worked with a zoo in Miami and then the Hope Zoo in Kingston. They bring down the hatched, newly hatched iguanas. They build them up until they're about a kilo or two and a half pounds, and then hike them back up to the top of Hellshire Hills. Uh, I call this story the Dragons of Hellshire Hills. Uh, this one's called Stumpy because it's also missing a, a big piece of its tail, uh, and I got to feed it from my hand. So it's wild, but it's not afraid of people. Uh, I got to feed from my hand a, uh, an apple to this little girl. Um, so pretty amazing uh, wildlife rehab and species rescue stories from this, this tiny little uh, tourism uh, island. Uh, and here's one of the hatchlings as well with Julia's, uh, the technician student's uh, fingers in it. So I'm gonna skip this. This is a video, sort of my little TV pilot uh, that we tried to do just for my J Jamaica trip. Uh, you guys can email me, I can send you the link or if anyone's still at the end, we can watch it. Uh, together if you so ask, but for sake of time, we're gonna skip this one. So my next trip was uh, about a year and a half later. And here was the, I think it was 1984 Olympics that were here. Um, if anyone knows where that may be, but it's also the founding uh, country of medicine and philosophy. And right underneath this uh, olive tree, uh, Aristotle and Hippocrates, the founder of medicine, probably did a little bit of, uh, did, oh, look at that. Emma June, you figured it out. It is Greece, it's Athens, Greece, uh, which is where my wife is from. And so we went there for a vacation to visit her family. But of course, me being the veterinarian and, and, and sort of 
guy who can't sit still. I worked with the Nine Lives uh, Cat Rescue of Athens, and we uh, we treated, as well as I went to the island of Peros and worked with the uh, Aegean uh, Sea Wildlife uh, Hospital and, and rescued some birds and, and released some birds. But we basically went around Athens with the Acropoli, the the, the location where medicine and, and philosophy was formed back in the background it was pretty inspirational. And we treated all these street cats, which are loved and cared for by some of the performers and the restaurant owners, because it essentially these cats uh, keep away mice and, and birds and other vermin. Um, and some of these guys have eye issues and injuries. And this one's got a, a viral form tumor that we sort of dealt with with some injectable medication. Um, but the other thing that happened that we didn't plan on is uh, Greece is, is susceptible to wildfires. Um, and this past summer was the worst one they'd ever had, probably in about 150 years. Uh, and it lasted a good month. But there was a wildfire a couple of days before I arrived in this cottage town called Neobustas. And uh, about 2,000 homes were destroyed, I believe. Uh, 80 people, unfortunately, lost their lives trying to fight the fires and save their. Uh, save their homes, though there are also stories of people fighting the fires and, and saving their, their cottages and saving their, their family homes that had been with them for generations. There's one gentleman I met who, uh, along with his dog beside him, fought off the fire with first a garden hose, then bottled water, and when he ran out of bottled water, he went into his wine cellar and started pouring wine on his various plants and gardens. And he assured me he started with the cheap wine uh, and had some of the uh, expensive stuff left over. Um, and this, I mean, amazing story. And, and so we treated some farm animals um, and a lot of cats. This one had obviously a lot of burns. This guy had burnt off his pads pretty bad and, and, and spent about a week in the vet hospital afterwards uh, mending up. Um, and then we had some just some nice photos of, uh, of sunsets and whatnot. But we have a video coming up uh, of one of my favorite kitten that, that we rescued. Um, and uh, it all comes with a good story. He did find a home. So let's see if that video is next. So at the end of a pretty long day, we were actually lucky enough that one of our volunteers was able to give us a call, say a family of cats was spotted in this abandoned house. They've been here on their own for at least uh, four or five days. And the mother and the other siblings of this little guy are still running around. They're a little bit hard to get a hold of, but at least this guy was very hungry. We were able to feed him, pretty easily pick him up and give him a quick exam. He's definitely got some eye damage. He definitely has some lung damage, but as you can see, <laughs> he is full of energy. So uh, I think he just wants some more food. So we're going to be able to give him a bath, clean him up, and without a doubt, he'll find a home pretty darn quick, okay? Mwah. All right, I'll talk to you guys later. So he, uh, this is the same kitten here. Uh, he did go to the veterinarian and, and deal with, get some treatment for his lung damage and his eye damage. He found his forever home, and they actually named him Little Cliff after me, which uh, might, be one of my, one, might be one of my favorite uh, uh, honorariums, I guess. Maybe one of the only honorariums I've had so far. Um, so uh, Greece ended up being a great vacation, but even a greater sort of experience um, being able to work with these nine lives uh, cat rescue people. I've been back to Greece three times since then, including about two weeks ago. And uh, every time I go, I end up uh, spending a few days volunteering with this crew and uh, uh, strolling around the city of Athens and meeting people and and catching some of the cats and feeding them and vaccinating them and, and doing whatever we can to help them out. It's a great way to see the city volunteering and, and meeting new people. I highly recommend it. So with that, and you know, when I was in Greece, I dealt with some farm animals, some goats and some chickens, and obviously a lot of wild animals in, uh, in Jamaica. I kind of realized I have no experience with wild animals. Uh, although I'm, I'm, I'm licensed to do it, I'm, you know, veterinarians out of Ontario, and Cornell University in New York, which I should say every single year beats my college for a better veterinary school. Uh, Cornell is usually number two, uh, occasionally number three. We're always either number three or number four. We're always one step under you guys uh, uh, in New York, but we're licensed to do work with wildlife, but we don't have a lot of experience. So I ended up volunteering with Shades of Hope, uh, which is a wildlife uh, rescue organization about an hour north uh, of Toronto. 
And I go there every single Friday. I'm going there tomorrow. Um, so it's been three years of going once a week uh, with my daughter, who's in the bottom here and uh, on with the mask. And, you know, you see we're dealing with a porcupine and a fox and a baby raccoon and uh, this red tail hawk that my daughter is holding. Uh, possums, more foxes, some baby bears. That was pretty special. Porcupines again. And, you know, I didn't know anything about wildlife medicine. So this, this allowed me to get a lot better and allowed me to practice. Um, and I didn't even do orthopedic surgery. Like even with dogs, I don't do broken bones, or at least I didn't. But this is all they see here, or, or a lot of what they see, especially the birds, you know, getting hit by cars or flying into, flying into, um, buildings or trees or wolf the uh, bald eagle that we're going to talk about that got shot and then crashed to the ground um there's a lot of broken bones and then there's raccoons that think i'm either funny or about to bite my neck so there's no scars so i guess he thought i was funny uh, a lot of cool animals i mean this was a you know this is a chance of a lifetime to deal with these these amazing creatures um and and sometimes Sometimes uh, a mule will kiss a jackass or the other way around, I'm not sure. Um, but we, we do like to make friends with our patients uh, uh, if we can. Um, so as I was saying, I, don't really, I didn't really know how to treat broken bones, but it was so common that they basically said, get a book and start learning because you're our only veterinarian. We see six to 7,000 animals a year that we intake. And uh, we just can't have, you know, someone coming in once a month to deal with this because they had another volunteer vet before me who's no longer uh, working with them. So they let me start to practice. And, and the first bird, you know, had a broken uh, leg. And I kind of said, well, I don't, I don't really know how to do this, but I've read the book. And they basically said, if you can't fix this, we're going to euthanize this, this bird. We have to. So you might as well try. And we tried and I set the bone really, really well. I pinned it really well. Unfortunately, the bird passed away before I even started surgery. It passed away from the anesthesia. But I did the surgery anyways to practice and the x-rays looked good. And then the second bird was, uh, was an owl and it had a broken humerus, so the, the upper arm bone. And it unfortunately, it survived surgery, but it passed away when we were doing x-rays at the end, again, under anesthesia but the x-rays looked good and I was getting better. But anesthesia is very tricky with birds for various reasons. But this bird, this red-tailed hawk was my third uh, bird bone surgery. And you can see uh, on its uh, right shoulder, the little green uh, bandage. Well, that's actually the pin coming up through the bone, coming out the shoulder. We do these, uh, they're called intermedullary or in the bone pins that run the length. And then we do the special bandage to prevent the rotation. And after about three or four weeks, because birds heal really, really quickly, you just lightly sedate them and pull that pin, throw in a single stitch, and then some rehab. And if you're lucky enough, you get to release them. And I got to release this one as well as another red-tailed. And of course, we took pictures and videos. So let's check this out. I like to do this really fast. I go back and forth really fast and it's like it's flying at me. And watch this video of the second one. This is the one I did not treat this one. It was just another one that needed to be released, but the next one I got to treat. And it was that one that we saw about three or four pictures ago. So exciting. It was, uh, yay. Yeah. This was, uh, I was almost tearing up uh, when I did this. Uh, and sometimes when I talk about it, my voice cracks. Um, this is why we do it, right? Like wildlife medicine has become a new passion of mine and wildlife rehabilitation and being able to release them. And, and the cases I see, probably only about half of them make it to the point where they can be released. Or some of them we end up having to put to sleep right away because there's there's a, a set number of criteria they have to be able to obviously hunt or find food they have to be able to fly or run or uh, if they're um, if they're migrating animals they have to be able to migrate they have to be able to breed successfully um, so that's a big thing and if they don't follow those things we're not allowed to release them and we're actually not allowed to unless it's a very specific case 
there's laws against just filling up, you know, sanctuaries with these animals. Wild animals need to go back to the wild. So it's a pretty special time when we're able to uh, to release them. Um, that that hawk was a juvenile, so that hawk was like a teenager. It was probably about eight or nine months old. Um, its bright colors hadn't uh, come in yet, um, but uh, it was certainly old enough to uh, to fire a really really quickly. It flew up into a tree just far enough that we couldn't really get a, a look at, at it with our cameras, uh, except for this still photo, this woman down in the corner. Um, uh, and he just, you know, there's no thanks. They just look at us funny and just say, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Next time, don't hit us with your car, please. Um, but uh, no thanks needed. We're pretty, uh, we're pretty happy. Uh, let's see what's next here. So then comes Wolf. All right, so this is a bald eagle. Uh, one of the most beautiful animals in the world. I'm sure you guys don't uh, don't need to, to to be told that. And Wolf uh, was actually brought from Shades of Hope, this wildlife rescue, but brought to my clinic, uh, which is about 45 minutes away from them, um, because the injury happened on a Monday. I wasn't going to be there until Friday, and it was bad enough that they were worried that it couldn't wait. Um, and amazing video please go on my instagram or find it on youtube or email me at the end i can send you the link um, because there's some really cool footage of this giant female bald eagle that's about 10 pounds and looks to be 30 and just this gorgeous gorgeous animal um, that i just can't do justice with some of these uh, some of these photos um, and let's see here so this is what happens so this this bird was accidentally shot by duck hunters. The duck hunters had brought up their gun, their sort of buckshot to hit a, 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 a herd or a flock, pardon me, a flock of, of ducks. And she had swooped in to grab one of the ducks. She got clipped, crashed to the ground and broke her humerus bone again. And it went right out the skin. It was an open fracture. Now the hunters did the right thing when they saw this, they went in to the, to the marsh and grabbed her and then brought her to Shades of Hope. They could have just left her. So accidents happen, they're gonna be more careful and, and they were able to get her to, uh, to us. And so I ended up putting in, it's not a great X-ray, the angle, but I put in this one long IM pin that kind of runs diagonal. And then you can see a single, though there's another one, just the angle doesn't show it up. Then there were some external pins that come outwards from here that go into the bone as well. And then we use plumber's putty, which people put around drain pipes that form like this steel uh, compound. It's actually a calcium carbonate, I think. And this putty sticks to these, these other pins to prevent rotation, okay? So to create this matrix that's gonna hold this bone steady. Cause this bird is so strong. And as you'll see later, kind of nasty, which is a good thing that wild animals get nasty with us, that we needed to not just rely on bandaging to keep that bone from rotating. We had to have some really strong, uh, really strong pins in there. Um, so then she went back to Shades of Hope for about uh, four weeks of, of rest and recovery. And here she's trying to bite uh, Sarah, one of the animal uh, technicians there. And that's when they started naming her Wolf because she was as nasty as a wolf. Um, and let me just slow. stop this video. This is, so this is now on the northern border of the Niagara River. Uh, this is about two months later. She, after Shades of Hope, she went to this owl rescue that had these large flight decks that she could practice her flying. And then they called me and said, would you like to release Wolf? Well, absolutely. I'm doing, going to do the 90 minute drive, uh, go out onto the frozen river and release this girl. Well, if you remember the story of Jack the One-Eyed Crocodile and Dr. Trawford um, staying away from animals and not getting bitten, that was a lesson that I didn't learn. And Wolf was uh, very quickly, uh, there's the bald eagle video, perfect. Uh, Wolf very quickly uh, taught me that lesson. So just pay attention to my one hand that gets way too close to Wolf's beak. Oh, and then like I said, we didn't push her until later. Okay, so, oh, oh, did she get ya? <laughs> so I had, I had lost focus. I was so amazed by this girl that I just stuck my, uh, I just stuck my hand in there without ever really thinking. And I'm gonna do this again. 
listen, you can hear her uh, her beak snap together. Okay, so. Oh, oh did she get ya? <laughs> now, she probably could have taken my finger off. Uh, definitely done a, a, a very deep laceration. Um, so I like to think that she was actually, she was saying thank you. Um, she was teaching me a lesson to respect their, their space and to be careful, but she was doing it in a way where she was also saying, but I really appreciate you helping me get better. So I'm just going to teach you, teach you a soft lesson instead of the, uh, the hard lesson. And the next video is even better. And, uh, it's, it's, it's wolf finally flying away. Look at that. She's so beautiful. Yay. Ta-da. So pretty special, uh, pretty special moment. And the last time I looked, the Dodo video of me and Wolf had about uh, 60 million views. So pretty, uh, pretty spectacular. Uh, you're all right, Eve. That is, uh, it's a pretty beautiful sight. So the wildlife uh, learning and, and, and uh, education continued. This is a coyote. Um, and I thought, finally, I'm in the element, right? This is just a hairy, crazy dog. And I've been dealing with dogs for over 20 years, finally in my element. But unfortunately, Wiley Coyote had broken his bone. And fixing a bone on a mammal is much harder than fixing a bone on a bird. And I still wasn't anywhere near an expert at dealing with bone, uh, bone fractures, though I am getting better. This is a very difficult break too, because it's of his shin and it's incredibly close. I don't know, can you guys, give me a thumbs up, Joanna, if you can see my uh, mouse indicator. Yeah, perfect. So it's incredibly close to the ankle. Um, and normally you would plate this, but then you gotta remove the plate. And we can't do this because this guy's gotta be released and all kinds of problems. And I didn't know how I was gonna be able to get the pins through these. We were gonna do these cross-sectional pins much like we did with Wolf, except the bone is so much thicker, I just can't drive it with my fingers. Now, if there's any contractors here paying attention, any renovators or people that are uh, handymen or women and carpenters, um, they just know you just need a drill, right? Well, I didn't have a surgical drill, but we, what we did have was contractors working at Shades of Hope that day, putting on some new cages. So we actually went out and asked if we could borrow their regular uh, uh, regular uh, garden variety garage drill. And we just, you know, dipped everything in alcohol and sterilized it and used special uh, sort of wraps and whatnot. And we ended up drilling pilot holes and then putting two cross pins into this very precarious position. You can even see right here where the pilot hole was a little big, but at least it got it in there. And then there's teeth on the uh, uh, there's like threading on the pin that would bring that once we were able to, to twist it and chuck it in, it was able to pull itself in. So not a great surgery, but with this in a cast, we kind of hoped that it would be enough. Oops. But Wiley Coyote made it very difficult for us. He, uh, he tried to escape and he ended up half breaking off the pins. So we had to remove the pins and get them on special antibiotics. And then he was chewing and, and banging his cast against the wall and he almost escaped a second time and then almost ate one of the uh, ducks that live at the, uh, at the place but couldn't catch him because he had a broken leg. All kinds of problems. And we finally removed all these different bandages and casts after about six weeks, even though he's limping heavily and hoped that he would sort of exercise it himself. We put him in this special long sort of run of a cage where he could go back and forth and exercise. And we would even make him move around with certain food and treats and he'd have to dig to find food. And we got to release this guy again and you won't be able to tell which one is, uh, which one is, is hurt. So clearly he's, he's doing okay. The Dodo also did a story on this guy, but check out the slow motion video of him uh, running away in the, uh, in the snow.
Now the next video is the same one, but it's from my camera. This is me standing behind here. It was very cold that day. And what you'll see in this one is, let me just quickly click on it and then pause it, is as he comes out to show that he's a wild animal and he doesn't need help from humans anymore, he completely ignores this nice sort of bridge and, and, and pathway over the rocks and the bush and just decides to make his own path. But look how fast this guy can run once he's released. And off he goes. And we released him in a, in a similar area that he was uh, found in because they are territorial. Um, so he'll recognize the sense of his, uh, of his neighbors. He'll know where his territory is um, and he'll sort of know his hunting spots and the places that he can go to, to stay safe and warm. Um, you can hear traffic in the background. Uh, it'd be nice to release him away from traffic, but again, we have to uh, release him in his original area. But hopefully this was a car accident, uh, a hit by car uh, issue. So hopefully he's learned his lesson to look both ways before he crosses the street. Um, so that, that was our first, uh, that was my first mammal um that was my first mammal orthopedic surgery and 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 went went pretty good not without challenges but did okay so by far my most uh interesting and memorable wild animal case if anyone can uh guess what kind of animal this is uh the you know we had the american crocodile this is also an american etc uh, we named this guy BFF. Uh, let's see, we got some other. So here he has a broken uh, shin again, right near his ankle. So very similar to uh, to the coyote. Um, and so obviously, I bet you someone got it. Yeah, it's a frog. It is an American bullfrog. BFF stands for big friendly frog, maybe, or effing frog, or... Uh, it depends. Kate, who is one of the animal rescuers, is from Australia, and they have a very spicy uh, vocabulary. So uh, I think you can guess what the second F or the first F stood for. But this guy was about, he was like the size of a, of a, of a small submarine sandwich. He was, a, he was like, a dinner, like a small dinner plate. He was an enormous frog. Um, now here's the, here's the funny situation. So how do you anesthetize a frog, right? We're trying to stick a tube down its throat, but frogs can hold their breath. He is sedated here, but he's still awake. Frogs can hold their breath for 20, 30 minutes, right? As they stay underwater. So we put the tube down his throat, but he wasn't taking breath. So there was no way for him to take the gas. He was too small for us to bag it, and like to sort of force the gas, <coughs> pardon me, force the oxygen and gas into his lungs. And they have a very unique lung system as well that it doesn't really handle sort of that assisted breathing. Does anyone know how the frogs take in oxygen? They can actually take in oxygen while they're underwater. They don't have gills, so they can't breathe oxygen from the water itself. But if anyone has any ideas, please, uh, please shout it out. We, what we ended up doing was Kate, this woman from Australia that, that now works at Shades of Hope, she reached out to some of her friends in Australia at the Frog Hospital, the National Frog Hospital, which only in Australia, they have an entire hospital dedicated to frogs. I'm definitely going there one day and telling them the story about BFF. Uh, that is absolutely right, Emma June. They can absorb it through their skin. Uh, same thing for Deja Mill, very good. Um, so what you'll see here is a big syringe full of fluid and actually the next photo is even better here he is lying on his back i think he's looking like he's in a spa and he did this for about 20 minutes he was just chilling out lying on his back my daughter's got the blue gloves she's holding his head up out of the water so he doesn't drown or doesn't aspirate some of that fluid in the water is anesthetic liquid that later normally turns to gas so we calculated a very specific percentage and then the person holding the syringe is a vet student from Scotland actually who was uh, volunteering with us and she would pull some of the fluid out of this little hot tub bath that he was in and then give him a bath every 10 seconds and if she didn't do it fast enough 
his heart rate would pick up or he'd start to wiggle a little bit because he was starting to feel some of the pain. So he's lying on his back. He's getting this sort of neck massage by my daughter. He's getting a bath from, uh, from Joanna, a different Joanna. And, uh, and then he's got his one leg hanging out that I'm working on. Like he's sitting, uh, he's sitting at uh, the nicest uh, vacation resort. Um, so it was the craziest surgery in the world to be giving anesthesia to a frog through its skin, but he did okay. And we just put a pin up and you can kind of see how we went through, uh, through the, uh, ankle upwards towards the knee. Um, and then there's another angle there and then bandaged them up with this sort of special moist cast. Cause you can't put regular sort of glue or vet wrap or, or anything with dye on their skin because they'll actually burn their skin because they'll absorb those chemicals. Um, but here is a BFF with a, uh, with a kind of a soft cast over this broken ankle um, as he quickly came out of the haze of his uh, sponge bath induced anesthesia. Uh, definitely the craziest case I've ever done. This was uh, only about six months ago. Uh, and definitely Joanna from the library there, definitely her favorite, uh, her favorite case of mine as well. Um, so I got a lot of experience with wildlife uh, and I'm still volunteering there, but um, two years ago, I then went to my next volunteer trip. And again, if anyone thinks they know where it is, please, uh, please speak up. This is right outside the, uh, the animal rescues uh, sort of front door. Um, the busiest streets in the world that I've ever seen. We got wild pigs running around and uh, apparently occasionally uh, people catch them and eat them if they're super hungry. Poverty is a big problem in this, uh, in this, this country as well. And we treated street dogs and other animals. And if you look way in the background, there's another animal just kind of chilling out that might give you an idea of the country that we are in. And that's my daughter. She, again, joins me on all these trips now as a, uh, as a sort of future veterinary technician. Um, though, honestly, there's a lot of things with wildlife that she can do better than even, even I can now. Like, She's a master at bandaging. There's special bandages that wild birds need um, to protect different joints. And I don't know how to do it. I just ask her to do it. So, um, so she's a, a chop off the old block. That's for sure. It is in India. That's right. Great job. I thought the camel might surprise somebody and make them think Egypt. But yeah, we were in uh, Hyderabad, India, uh, which is the mid southwest part of the state of Telangana. Uh, 10 million people, um, not a tourist place. So people were pretty, uh, pretty surprised to see us there because there's really nothing to do but work. Um, and we were the only uh, Westerners that I saw over the entire three weeks. Um, you know, met some amazing people. This, uh, this little lady, uh, my daughter's only about five foot two. So you can imagine how short this woman is. Um, her name is uh, Datu. Datu runs the PFA, People for Animals Shelter, um, and, and basically kind of became our mother and took care of us and got us tea and coffee and, and some, uh, some great little uh, street food treats. Um, very spicy, um, but uh, amazing people. And this gentleman in the red shirt was actually my first hiree as a veterinarian, Dr. Samad Khan who then left years later to uh, run a hospital in um, Qatar. And the reason I went to Hyderabad is that's where he grew up. So we knew some veterinarians there and he was able to arrange some stuff. And then he surprised me. He was actually there on vacation and surprised me and worked with me for a few days. I hadn't seen him in about a decade. So it was a bit of a, a tear filled uh, reunion. It was pretty special. Um, he's thinking of retiring or semi-retiring and coming back to Canada. So. I told him he has a job with me at any time. He can he can show me a few things these days. Um, Part of it's the so here's a video just kind of talking about our experiences and the wonderful people of India. Um, we're doing okay. What time is it? Uh, you know what? I'm going to skip some of these. Uh, they're more just kind of cute. Uh, some wonderful people. Here's uh, the team rescuing a little baby elephant. 
it was the end of flood season and this elephant uh, um, was being raised to be used as like a working animal in farms, uh, very well treated and just like say a horse on a, on a working farm. Um, but uh, they had to uh, get it out of the flood zone. So they were loading it up onto this truck and he seems pretty happy. This, this leash is obviously not that uh, tight around its neck that he's not trying to get away. Um, now the boys, this became a common theme in a lot of our trips that the, the young men, uh, the teenage men seemed really enthralled with my daughter. Um, I guess uh, it's pretty obvious why, uh, that's how teenage boys are. Um, and uh, they would bring her drinks and coffee and, and here she is working on a little cupcake, one of the, uh, one of the rescue dogs. Um, and then this is, the, this is the shelter. So we were doing surgery on this rusty table. We just put down a clean blanket outside in the sun. And if it started raining, they threw a tarp over us and we just kept working. And it's pretty, uh, pretty um, uh, uh, it's almost like field medicine, you know, uh, pretty primitive, but uh, the medicine's good and the, the pain control is amazing. So the animals did very, very well. Uh, we mostly dealt with dogs the first week we were there. Um, this case is a, a rabies case that unfortunately had to be euthanized. Uh, rabies is a big problem in India, about uh, 50,000 uh, people a year in India alone die from rabies and almost all of them are children. And then this dog on the right is a dog that was in a house fire, unfortunately. Uh, but it took a lot of work, but he actually rec recovered and he's just got some bald spots, but he looks pretty cute still. Um, but uh, pretty pretty bad case that, that first day. He uh, had some serious problems. Um, then we dealt with a lot of, uh, I used to call them homeless dogs, but they're actually street dogs. And the difference is, is their homes are the streets and they're very well cared for. Um, and they've got different shop owners and different families that can't let them in their, their houses. Their houses are so small. They'll have like six or seven people living in a, in a one bedroom you know, place. So they don't have room for dogs. And the dogs get to go from place to place and get fed and get called different names and get petted from all the different children. So they're happy. I mean, this little guy I called Champ, he's probably only six months old and he would come by the clinic once he realized I would give him food, but he wouldn't let me pick him up. And, he, and it wasn't that he was scared or angry. He just, he just didn't want to. He was free and, and, you know, so that's why I call him little Champ and he would just hang out and he owned his own little block on the street and and, and seems super, uh, super happy to be there. So it kind of taught me the difference between a homeless dog and a dog who just chooses to be free, right? Kind of like the wild animals that I was really- This country and spirituality is a big thing. So again, this is a story for sake of time, I'm gonna skip it, but I'll go at the end of this, let me see if I can find, yeah. So at the end, this is us releasing a bunch of the dogs back to the street. Uh, and you'll just see how happy the people are there to see them and that that it's their family it's just sort of a an extended turn them to the street but their families their neighbors and the shop owners still considered these dogs family <laughs> The dog comes out and starts wagging its tail, and everyone's like, Tuppy, Tuppy, you're home, you're back! Tuppy, Tuppy, Tuppy! So yeah, it was a pretty, uh, it was pretty emotional day. We'd had some bad cases, unfortunately, some that didn't go the way we wanted, which happens. But then we were able to release these, uh, these handful of dogs uh, to their various uh, sort of neighborhood families, and it was, uh, it was quite emotional. And you saw, there were like 30 people out waiting for this dog to come back, uh, all excited to see it. So, and he was wagging his tail and, and as happy as could be. Uh, so then we did start seeing some wildlife. Uh, we went from the very, very small bats in Jamaica to the very large bats in India. This is a, uh, a great fruit bat or a flying fox. Um, he had uh, been hanging from a tree, wrapped up in this stuff called manja wire, which is like kite wire, because they have these huge kite festivals, amazing uh, sort of spectacles and, and, and festivities and celebrations. But then the wires are left trapped on these, uh, these trees and bushes and, and whatnot. And, and the bats get caught up in it. A lot of birds get caught up in it. This guy had it wrapped around his feet and it kind of damaged his one digit and needed some rehabilitation. But uh, here I am not 
totally oblivious of some of the diseases they can be carrying. Uh, I, I started to learn, one, keep your fingers away from bald eagles, two, start wearing gloves more often. Um, though I do find it kind of affects the way I can feel the, the joints and whatnot, but uh, this guy behind me is, uh, is a lot smarter than I am. Um, and, and, and I certainly learned, because afterwards they're like, you really should be wearing gloves. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, and then we ended up dealing with, obviously, uh, a wild animal. This is a rhesus monkey um, named Clementine, or I named her Clementine. And she was found with a broken jaw and a laceration over her head and some pretty severe damage to her arm. Um, she'd been hit by a car. Um, and we unfortunately had to amputate the arm. And the biggest problem we had was stopping her from going at the wound. And silly us, we stuck one of those e-collars on her. She would, the second she woke up from sedation and anesthesia from surgery, she would just feel this thing, find the knot, undo the knot, pull off the e-collar and literally throw it at us. Uh, and we had to anesthetize her a couple of times to deal with wounds and sort of minor complications. And every single time was the same. And then we finally figured out a way and we went and got a baby sleeper, a little jumpy, a little jumper. Uh, her name, we named her Clementine. This is, uh, this, is name, this is a Clementine color. It actually says on the back, uh, Mommy's Little Pumpkin. Um, so we put on this giant jumper and we tied a knot and we sutured it sort of to, uh, to a collar around her neck and uh, got to the point that she was able to, uh, to heal up and eventually get what is called a soft release, where she went to this kind of kind of half sanctuary, half wild place where there'll be food available. There's no cars around. Um, and uh, my understanding is she got pretty fat pretty fast. So that's a, that's a pretty good thing. But uh, it was a challenging situation until we figured out to uh, dress her up like a, like a baby and it seemed to work out. Uh, Work out great. I think she looks like uh, she looks a little bit like me, so I'm like a proud papa there in this photo. Of their life. It's been a really crazy. Let's see here. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, very adorable. Um, so again, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this video. It just kind of goes on to sort of show different stories. There's the bat up in the tree. Then they didn't have a, a helmet big enough uh, to fit me. There's the bat there. Uh, we kind of talk about the monkey, et cetera, et cetera. Again, if you check out the YouTube channel, there's all kinds of videos. Though YouTube took one of the monkey stories off because they said it was too graphic. Although there's graphic warnings and I went and showed them that there are other videos showing that the monkey ended up doing well. Um, and there's certainly other veterinarian animal rescue YouTube channels that have much more graphic stuff than us. But they took it off. So if you really want to see the full story, uh, reach out to me and I can, uh, I can send you a link to my Instagram page. And it's got some really, really cool uh, stories. But this one episode introducing uh, the viewer to uh, Clementine the monkey is no longer on YouTube, unfortunately. So that is India. And then the last place we went uh, traveling was right before COVID hit. It was February of 2019. Um, and again, let's see if you guys can. So I went, my daughter's uh, over here. That's her uh, roommate, Melody, who did some filming. And then uh, Gaia, who's actually been Jamaica, India, and now this place, I almost gave it up. Uh, he's done all the filmies and now he's dating my daughter. So. Uh, I guess I kind of helped that along. Uh, it was bound to happen. They're all about the same age. So, um, so we went, uh, we went literally a couple of days after the first case of COVID was found in Ontario and it was in Toronto and we were joking. My family didn't want me to go. And we were joking that it was uh, safer there than here, uh, because there was no reported cases. So Here's us. Uh, we did take a little bit of uh, a couple hours off to ride some horses uh, over the sand. Um, but again, any ideas of where we may be, please speak up. Dun, dun, dun. I want you to make it pretty simple at this point. I thought this photo would catch people and they would say Greece because this is Santorini and this is the flag of Greece, sort of. 
but it is not Greece. What do we got? Egypt. Very good. So this is in Alexandria. We went to Cairo, but we did one day in Alexandria. And Alexandria is right over the sea, like right south of Greece. Um, so there's a lot of like a Greek heritage there. Um, but we're literally riding Mustangs in the Sahara Desert here. Um, so yes, we went to Cairo uh, and we actually saw, I will show this video because it is my favorite, where we got to go into some some uh, uh, pyramids that no one knows about. You know, it's kind of uh, uh, the tourists don't go there. So we, we didn't have to uh, deal with crowds and you actually got to go in. Um, I was actually a little disappointed by the Giza pyramids. I mean, they're big and they're beautiful and it's kind of cool trying to figure out how they are built. But if you are allowed in, and we were allowed into the one section, it was like we were sitting in some guy's basement that wasn't finished. It was just a concrete sort of room. Whereas these other pyramids that I'll show you later, we got to, uh, we got to see. So here's a video just showing the first day of Egypt. Uh, it's only a couple minutes long, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna run it. So, uh, arrived at Egypt at 2 a.m. this morning after a long uh, couple of flights and uh, after a quick nap we decided to visit the Forever Rescue Foster. It's a dog shelter here in Cairo and it takes care of about 400 dogs which is kind of a drop in the pan for the two million that are homeless here in uh, the country of Egypt. It's, uh, it's pretty overwhelming. Um, we've dealt with the craziness of India and the craziness of Jamaica and Greece and Northern Canada. Um, the big thing here are the numbers, um, the dust obviously being by a desert, and the ticks are unbelievable. Now we actually lucked out that we came in one of their uh, monthly tick visits where they do tick treatment uh, and they basically go through all 400 dogs. It's quite a work for Ahmed and the team. And they'll basically one at a time pull a dog from uh, one of the big cage enclosures that it's at and they'll uh, examine it and pull off ticks that they can find. And then um, applying. So again, this uh, we worked exclusively with this uh, this one dog rescue. We did some stuff out in the community in some of the sort of underserviced areas with their help and then treated and, and dealt with a lot of the rescue cases with them uh, as well. And the main reason. Okay. That the main reason we came was for this guy Salim, um, or or we were going to go to Egypt and go to Cairo anyways. But we knew about Salim about a month before. Someone had, and the video I'm going to show does have some graphic footage, uh, so I will warn you. But it's really important to to see. You can maybe watch with your eyes closed a little bit. I don't think it's that bad, but. But some people may, may <laughs> I can see the young girls all excited to, uh, to, to see it. Um, unfortunately, someone, a lot of people don't like dogs in Egypt. A lot of the people in Egypt, there's half of the people that love them and want to do everything they can to take care of them. Like the woman, Noha, who's running this shelter. And then there's other people who hate them. And this, this someone had actually poured acid on Salim's face. And lost the eye, the ear ended up being damaged, there was some holes to the face and we had to do these major skin grafts. Um, and so we ended up taking him to a local clinic. Amazing people, I needed sort of uh, modern medicine. Now, these people in Egypt, the, the people in Egypt are tall, or at least I'm short. Let's say I'm short. I'm only about five, seven if I'm lucky. And they all joked that I was a short Canadian hockey player and they were all descendants of Pharaoh Kings and they were all much taller than me. And they thought it was hilarious that I needed to stand on this, uh, this platform to use their surgical tools. So they were playing a bit of games with me. But the video coming up, the main story of the video coming up other than the work we did with Salim is the, the, the hope, which is kind of interesting because Salim means hope in Arabic. The hope and the the persistence and the stubbornness, but in a good way, of the woman Noha, who refused to give up on Salim, and we were ready to give up and say we weren't going to be able to fix this guy, but she basically said, "Do your job, get it done, do the best you can," and things worked out uh, quite well in the end. So let's just watch a little bit about that. Uh, and this is just some of the post-op stuff. Uh, it looks pretty awful, but he did very, very well. And they just do this silver, 
spray to, to stop with infection, but here's the video. The entire ear has died, the base of the ear, the base of the pin. And I was planning on doing an advancement flap with the skin forward, but all that skin is dead. Okay? It's a lot worse than we thought. Um, the wound or the bite, I think that happened a couple of days ago, has caused a major necrosis of the ear. And the skin I was going to use to fix the defect, to fix the injury, is itself quite diseased and dying. So, this may not work. Let's just focus on doing our best here and then we can look at sort of other ways. Great. He is eating on his own. He's putting on weight. His bowel movements are fine. He's getting up to urine. And the most important ending to that story is Salim left Cairo recently to go to the UK where he's now living in a home and, you know, uh, missing his ear and his eye and he's got the scar on his face, but uh, he's got this gorgeous smile and he too is getting fat like all, all the other rescue animals, which is a great story. So uh, Salim, uh, uh, he would have gone a lot sooner, but, um, but COVID sort of really messed things up. Uh, and I thank you for the amazing job uh, comment there. Um, it was, uh, it, you know what? No hot taught me. No hot taught me not to give up and, uh, uh, just try our best. And, and, and often uh, I think someone's looking out for these, uh, these animals and, and helps them, uh, helps them get better. Here's just a shot that I thought was amazing, uh, that my camera buddy, uh, took as we were driving past the Being a veterinarian, I saw that video and I noticed that the uh, the horse has a slight lameness in its front left uh, front left leg. Um, but it was just a nice uh, nice shot. I uh, oops. So the very last, we only got about three minutes left, uh, and then we're all done. Um, I just want to show the man with the uh, not so golden gun. Um, he ended up giving us a tour. We met him through just a random kid that I was playing with soccer with on the street when we went for a bit of a walk outside of, uh, of this, this shelter, this dog rescue. And his father or grandfather is this guy. I didn't know he was packing heat when I agreed to pay him to let us into his desert, which was part of the Sahara Desert, and to show us these pyramids that no one else is allowed to see. Um, seemed legit to me, right? Like. You know, it was 20 American dollars per person. What's the worst that could happen? Again, I didn't know he had a gun until later, but he was he was a very nice gentleman. And uh, and and this this coming video is all travel based, no animal rescue. But to me, the the scenery and the the history is the most amazing thing in the world. And you'll even see, just like the boys in India, the boys in Egypt uh, were showing off for my daughter and for Melody. Uh, by ripping around in their uh, little tuk-tuk uh, scooter thingamajigs and doing tricks. So uh, they always seem to like the, 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 the young ladies uh, all around the world. Let's go.
talk our way into being allowed into the Sakata pyramid when it's closed. We are literally standing in the sarcophagus of an ancient Egyptian pharaoh whose body has been moved to the uh, Museum of Egypt. Just over on the next side is the sarcophagus of his wife, so he can be buried beside her. This is, uh, this is unbelievable. This is time of our life, without a doubt. pretty special day uh, we never planned on that but uh, with all my travels I've learned over the years to just start introducing yourself to people and and get out of the white picket fences of resorts and and go find some of the locals and find some of the hidden gems that the tourists aren't at and uh, you know you might be lucky enough to uh, have a guy carrying a gun take you out into the desert all by yourself and uh, <laughs> Hope, hope that everything's okay, but uh, um, everything went great. I mean, everybody's, uh, I think 99.99999% uh, of the people out there are good people. Um, so it's worth, uh, it was worth it. And, and one of the best experiences in my life, uh, without a doubt, is, is seeing the history and the, the culture of, of the true Egyptian pyramids versus these large pyramids where there's, you know, hundreds of people and, people selling stuff and buses and whatnot. So um, this is something that that you can do. You can you just gotta you just gotta ask enough questions, right? And just keep telling people, I want to get away from the tourists. I want to do something special. I want to do something special and and talk to locals and 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 you can get some pretty cool, uh, pretty cool experiences. So that's it for my stories. Um, you know, I guess one of the things I want to take from this, or I want you guys to take from this, or one of the things I've learned from this is, although I love being a veterinarian, I love being a veterinarian, I wanted to do it since I was five years old, I always wondered what I was going to do when I retire, you know, uh, and, and there will come a time that I'm going to retire from clinical practice, and traveling and volunteering and working with wildlife and working with these different rescue groups in, in far off places has given me a glimpse of what I'm going to do later, you know, what I'm going to do when I'm 60 or 70 or even older, that I can still have these skills and, and still experience some of these adventures, right? Um, so, you know, I guess my takeaway from it is, is challenge and chase those dreams and, and challenge yourself and get uncomfortable, learn new things, learn new skills. Uh, have some fun experiences like uh, like surfing in Lake Ontario when it's uh, below freezing and you get this cool ice beard, um, and uh, and and life's gonna be life's gonna be exciting. So that's about it for that. I guess the next one is if anyone has any questions, um, and you are very welcome for for sharing everything, uh, Eve. Um, so that's that's about it. We have. Uh, we're actually leaving in a week to go to Panama. So the volunteer travels are finally starting up again. Emily and I leave uh, next Thursday for two weeks, a week of volunteer in Panama City, and then another week in Boca del Toro, where we're doing spay neuter clinics and working with some of the indigenous communities. And there might be one day, maybe two days of surfing while we're there, we'll see. Uh, apparently some of the animal rescue people are, are surfing uh, 
experts, so they're going to take us to some of their special places. Um, Southampton and Surf. I will, whoever that is, OB, reach out to me because I will take you up on that if you're a surfer. Uh, I will totally do that. Uh, I'm not very good, but I'm getting better every day. Um, and uh, there's some pretty, there's some pretty amazing waves on Lake Ontario and on the Great Lakes. So uh, uh, just last week, it was like five, six foot waves. Um, I was in Greece, unfortunately, where there weren't any waves. So it kind of, you know, kind of messes things up, but, uh, but it was great. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, uh, ask me any questions and someone wants to be like me. No, no, no. You want to be like you and just, you know, uh, just, uh, extra special you, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, that's, but